What's up guys, West Coast Picks here, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about 3D printers. I'm going to make a 3D printed uh, pinning tray, I'm going to show you everything that's involved with doing that, and also uh, everything that's involved with uh, 3D printers. <laughs> I always get a lot of questions about which 3D printers to buy, uh, what kind of options to look for and stuff like that, and how it all works. So that's what this video is going to be, much like my 3, uh, 3D, or sorry, CNC router, uh, this will be my 3D printer video. Uh, but it's kind of be lock sport related because I'm going to be making a pinning tray. Um, this is my 3D printer. It's an ANET A8. Uh, you can get a bunch of different ANETs. This is actually a clone of a... Um, oh, what's the name of it again? I can't remember the actual name of it. But it's, it's a clone of a very, very well-known 3D printer. And um, it is one of the most common 3D printers around right now, which is, you know something that's, <laughs> that in and itself is worth having. But um, basically, all 3D printers work the same. You have a print bed that uh, the printer prints on. You have a, a hot end, which does the printing. And you have motors that move the hot end around. So basically, and then you have a power supply and a computer that does all the, the brain work. And sometimes a display. Uh, that's essentially every 3D printer in a nutshell. So what makes some 3D printers different than others? Well, options. Um, what, what it can do. Um, this is one of the cheaper 3D printers around, but it is one of the cheaper 3D printers around, but it has one of the most options of all the cheaper 3D printers around. So um, some of the things that you're going to look for in a 3D printer that you're going to want to look for and that this has is a heated print bed. The print bed is actually heated. Uh, the computer controls the heat of the print bed. You can actually set the temperature and everything. And what that does is it actually uh, helps the plastic stick down to the print bed as it's printing. Without heat, uh, in a lot of applications, your print's just going to go, you're going to be printing a pile of spaghetti. So what some people will do, if you don't have a heated print bed, some people will actually put glue down, like a spray adhesive, down on the print bed just to get the plastic to stick. Well, it prints, um, which, you know, it's not, don't need to tell you that's messy. There's other things you can do too, but, uh, you know, none of it's ideal. So you want a heated print bed. That way, you, no fuss, no muss. Uh, it heats up, makes good prints. Um, you also want the ability to print PLA and ABS. Uh, PLA is, everything will print PLA. Um, not all cheap 3D printers will print ABS. This one will. So uh, you can always upgrade it later, but it's cool if it comes with that. Another thing you're going to want is common parts uh, and support. So this machine here is actually, like I said, a clone of another machine. But before the original machine was even invented, all these parts already existed. None of it was, was made for this machine. Um, the major parts. The frame was obviously made for this machine and the rods were cut to the size of this machine and, you know, things like that. But the motors, the computer, the hot end, um, the display, everything already existed before this computer was even invented or this printer was even invented. So none of these parts are proprietary to this machine. Uh, they're very common. They've been around. These are the most common parts for 3D printers. So they're around everywhere. They've been around for a long time, and they're very cheap. You can get them off Banggood for, like, super cheap. Um, the whole machine was only $200. So, you know, you get three, all three uh, print driver or uh, motors for, I don't know, like $20, $30 or something. Like, super cheap if you ever have to work on it. And uh, also, being one of the most common printers around, the support on it is just phenomenal. Like, so many people have one. So many knowledgeable people have one. Um, if you ever have any problems, the forums uh, will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, there's a lot of videos on how to put them together. There's a lot of videos on how to troubleshoot. There's a lot of videos on, uh, you know, how to, how to use everything. So... That is good. That is when I'm the beginning. I was saying being one of the most common ones is you know on its own is worth having this machine because everything is so easy to find, um, and 
if you have any problems, which I, you know, I've had problems with this machine, but you got to remember these are machines. They're not, it's not like a, a, a inkjet printer that you would buy and put on your counter and just make prints whenever you want them. This, these are finicky things. They are, as you can tell, an actual machine. So all the parts move. Everything moves on this thing. Things wear out. Moving things wear out. So um, nothing moving is worn out on this thing yet. Everything that's uh, that I've had to troubleshoot with this thing has been electrical. But again, they had to do with moving parts. So um, on this machine, my heat bed at the back, the connector... Um, melted a little bit because the only thing that's crimping the wire onto the pin in the back there is like this little metal crimp in this connector and of course there's not a lot of surface area connecting the crimp to the pin so it heats up there and um, yeah it kind of melted the connector so I just cut the connector off and I soldered it directly the heat bed directly to the wires and haven't had a problem since so uh, that's not an issue quick fix pretty easy um, the Glass insulated hot end wires because it's high, higher current to run the uh, hot end, and um, they are glass insulated wires. And because it heats up, you can't solder it there, they're crimped right at the base here. And the crimp actually uh, broke, and I had to go in there and put a new crimp in there. Um, other than that, this machine's been awesome, I haven't had to spend a penny on it, uh, fixing it or anything like that. Those fixes, those two fixes were all done with just stuff I had lying around, you know, solder and a, a crimp. Um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to want to be able to diagnose and fix things that go wrong with the machine. So I suggest buying it uh, in pieces and making it, <laughs> putting it together. Don't buy it pre-made because when it comes to work on it, you're not going to know what the hell to do. So buy it in pieces, put it together yourself. It's not that hard. Uh, it does take a while, but it's not that hard. There's videos everywhere on how to do it. And once you've done that, you'll know exactly how everything works and exactly how to uh, troubleshoot and fix any kind of thing that happens. Um, I have a number of upgrades on this machine, um, but they were all pretty much free or very, very cheap. So uh, the only, only one upgrade on here actually cost me any money. Uh, the free ones are anything that you can print out for this machine as an upgrade. Uh, the cooling duct upgrade, the frame rigidity upgrades, the filament guides, uh, there's belt tensioner upgrades, there's uh, end stop upgrades. Uh, all these ends, these uh, upgrades make the machine a little nicer to use and uh, make the print quality better. And uh, they're all free because you can print them out on the printer itself, which is awesome. The only upgrade I paid for was the glass on the uh, on the heat bed, so this machine obviously has the heat bed, uh, but it comes with an aluminum heat bed, and when you buy it, it comes with masking tape on the aluminum heat bed because you can't print directly onto the aluminum heat bed; the plastic will just come right off. So you put tape on the heat bed and you print on the tape, which is fine and it works. You know, works really good. It doesn't uh, the plastic doesn't come off or anything, but the problem is the plastic doesn't come off or anything. Here's the print side on a pinning tray that I made, and um, that is on masking tape. As you can see, a lot of the masking tape kind of came off with the board, and it leaves like the masking tape texture on the bottom of the board, which you know might not bother some people, but it's not ideal. You can see the texture of the masking tape itself. It's kind of like a wrinkle, you know, masking tape. It's kind of got like a wrinkle finish, so the uh, the print has got a wrinkle finish to it as well and uh, not to mention so you pry it off which is very hard to do you pry it off you have to wait for it to be like ice cold too because if it's still warm when you go to pry it off you'll just bend the board you just warp the plastic but um, so you let it cool down and then you go to pry it off and it is really hard and you always end up ripping the masking tape which means it's hard to clean off the back of your print but worse you have to strip all the masking tape off the print bed and lay a new layer down pretty much every print which is a pain in the ass so uh, what people do, and what I did, is went to glass. Glass is um, a lot better to print on. You just have to remember if you're using glass, a couple rules of thumbs, uh, a couple rules of thumb is clamp it down on all four corners. All four corners 
have to be cl clamped, otherwise it's going to throw your calibration out. If you only clamp the back of this plate, the front is going to lift up. Even just a, we're talking 0 0.02 of a millimeter accuracy. So everything counts. If you only clamp one side of the glass, then it's going to lift up. If you only clamp three corners, the fourth corner that lifts up is going to be enough to throw your print out. So make sure you clamp all four corners, calibrate your machine. When you're using glass, you also normally uh, you run your heat bed at around 50, 55. Turn it up five degrees from what you normally run because uh, you're heating up a thicker plate of glass now and there's more mass to actually disperse the heat. So if you actually turn the heat up a little bit, it helps quite a bit. Um, also, you can't print just on glass because it'll just fly off just like it does with the aluminum. So what you do is you use um, hairspray. So this is the hairspray I use, just dollar store hairspray. Got it from the dollar store. Just aerosol can hairspray. And um, I take the glass off the printer. And, you know, you don't want to do it on the printer because you don't want hairspray in all your parts. But take the glass off the printer and uh, you lay down a nice thick layer of hairspray on the glass. When you first start spraying the hairspray on the glass, it's going to go frosty. Uh, when you spray enough hairspray on the glass, it'll go clear again. Uh, if you've ever painted, you know what I mean, it kind of flows uh, and everything goes clear and you got a nice thick layer of hairspray all over the print side of the glass, you let it dry. Um, you can speed up the drying by putting it on the heat bed, turning the heat bed on and you let it dry. So hairspray has a unique property where when it's cold, it is glass. Like this is, this is hairspray on here right now. I can't scratch it or anything like that. It's it feels like like the glass but when it heats up it gets tacky and sticky and if this was heated up if I was to put my finger in there I would pull back and it would be all gooey and there'd be a fingerprint on the on the glass in the hairspray um, so the benefit is when you're printing and the heat beds on and the the hairspray is nice and sticky the plastic sticks to it no problem but when you're done printing and the heat bed cools down just a little bit. It doesn't have to like take, you have to wait for it to cool down all the way because the, the print has to actually be cold. In the, uh, with the hairspray, it gets down to about 35, 30 degrees and the hairspray hardens right up and you, the print will fall off your print bed. And, you know, it's still relatively warm. It's just, you know, to the point where the hairspray gets hard again and you can just pull it right off. You get nice, nice glassy finishes from the hairspray because it's just glass. And you don't have to replace the hairspray. Um, you do replace it after a while, say after about, it's hard to say, when it stops working. Um, I've only replaced the hairspray maybe two or three times since I started. So maybe every month or something like that, you replace the hairspray, which is easy. You just wash it, comes off with soap and water, dry it, and reapply the hairspray. Um, so it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot easier to work with, it lasts a lot longer, and it gives you a better finish. Glass and hairspray is where it's at. Um, you know, you calibrate your machine, we'll show you that after we make something, and uh, we'll calibrate the machine, and we will uh, print it out. But for now, uh, that's about it for the physical nature of the machine. Um, if you have any specific questions that I didn't talk about with 3D printers, you can uh, leave them down in the comments below here, and I'll uh, try to answer it the best I can. But for now, uh, we're going to move over to the living room in front of the TV, and I'm going to uh, show you what it takes to design... Uh, or download, decide and or download, and convert files over to be printed on the 3D printer. All right, guys, here at my main computer, uh, the living room. You can tell it's uh, widescreen. <laughs> um, so a couple options for uh, objects to print. Your first option, obviously, is making one, but your uh, second option is actually trying to find something that's already been made. Um, actually, it might even be your first option because there's so much stuff that's already been made that uh, chances are, if you have an idea, it might have already been done. Um, this is called Thingiverse. Thingiverse.com. And there is a bunch of, bunch of stuff on here. 
I've got stuff that I've made on here. Um, my pinning trays on here. Uh, the um, kick adapter and stuff like that. It's all on here. Uh, there's pretty much anything you can think of, and especially if you bought your own 3D printer. Um, say you bought the ANET A8. You can just type in A8 in the search engine here. And you can come up with all the upgrades for your printer. So there's uh, cooling duct upgrades, there's tool holder upgrades, there's belt tensioner upgrades, there's filament guide upgrades, belt chains, uh, tension adapters, Z-stop adjustment, fine adjustments. There's like literally every upgrade for your printer is here and can be printed out for free and installed for free on your printer. So... A lot of the print, a lot of the upgrades that you do will drastically improve your print quality. So things like uh, belt tensioners help a hell of a lot. Uh, cooling ducts help a hell of a lot. Uh, those kinds of things make your prints better, and um, they're free. You just download it and print it. I mean, very very awesome. Um, you know, strain uh, frame strengtheners and. And stuff like that. There's brackets. There's tons and tons of cool stuff that you can get for your printer. Uh, just download it and print it out. So you just uh, say so you wanted the the cooling duct. This is actually the same semicircular uh, cooling duct fan I use. And you just go download all files. Um, it'll come in as a zip. In that zip, there'll be a file called .stl. It'll be whatever is you know, semicircular a net a fan duct .stl. And that STL is the file that you use to um, to print, but there's another uh, another process you got to go through before that. So anyway, that's your first option is downloading something somebody else has already made. Uh, no design involved. There's a lot of stuff already there. Um, you can type in lock sport. There's already a lot of a lot of lock sport stuff here, uh, including stuff that I've made, uh, stuff that Bosnian Bills made. There's. Uh, some kick adapters, but they're not the universal kick adapters. I don't like these ones as good as I made. Uh, there's a lock sport model. You can see your serrated pins, your spooled, serrated spools, standard pin, just to, you know, a little show how's it going. There's a pinning tray. There's my pinning tray right there. There's uh, oval adapters, kick adapters. Um, there's a disc detainer key. Uh, blank so you can set your angles and stuff like that and see if you can get it to open your disc containers It's another pinning tray. There's your slag and quick set uh, gauges, which is pretty cool um, Yeah, more pinning trays uh, plug followers pick handles Just everything in here. There's foxy stuff. There's foxy's kick holder uh, There's my small pinning tray uh, there's my kick holder. Uh, there's tons and tons of lock sport stuff already. And uh, look, there's a follower and Euro adapters and all this stuff already for lock sport. Um, but also uh, anything else you can think of. If, if you own a, you know, I don't know what to say, like a, a cabinet knob, you know. Type in cabinet. Oh, look, a 3D arcade cabinet. There's a universal tool for cabinets. There's a, a latch cabinet lock. There's a cabinet handle. There's a, another cabinet lock. Uh, just tons of stuff. There's another little handle. There's these little knobs you can use for your cabinets. Uh, basically anything in here. You can find a lot of stuff. Anyway, um, that is your first option, is downloading something already made. Your second option is going to be uh, making your own object. So, to make your own object, I use a program called 123D Design. And you can use a number of programs, but this is the one that I got used to. It's actually not available anymore, but you can still download it. You just Google 123D Design Download, and you'll find the download, and you just download it and uh, install it. Um, but uh, basically, I had a head start when I started building objects for 3D printing because I already knew how to do it. Uh, not in this program, but 
um, I used to build uh, levels, maps for first-person shooters, namely uh, Half-Life, uh, Counter-Strike, Day of Defeat, and stuff like that. And um, building maps is the exact same thing as building a 3D object because you are building 3D objects within the map. And the map itself is a 3D object. So basically everything's a shape. You, you make shapes, you create shapes, and you put shapes together. You take shapes away from shapes, and you end up with your object at the end. So let me, uh, let me show you what I mean. We're going to make a quick pinning tray here. Um, we're going to go start. Everything is a shape, so we start off with a box. We go up to the top here. It says primitives, and we'll go box. And that gives us a little box here. Down at the bottom, you can see length and width. And this is um, length is going to be up and down, how high, high you want it, I guess. Because uh, remember, we're looking at it, at it top down. Um, a width is going to be, you know, obviously your width. And, um, sorry, length is going to be length, width, and then height is actually going to be the depth of the object. So, um, we want this thing to say be, um, what do we want it? 80, we'll go 100. It's 100 mil millimeters high. Everything, you can set it in inches, but I work in millimeters, so, you know, adjust accordingly. And our width is going to be 150. This is the size of a standard pinning tray, at least the ones that I make. And our height is going to be five millimeters because our five pin tray is five millimeters thick. So you can see we have just a square. This is not a pinning tray, but it will be one soon. Basically, what you got to do now is make other shapes and take them away from this shape. So um, say we want a, a trough up here, a parch tray up here. We would create another box. And our length is going to be, say we want it to be 25. And our width is going to be, well, the width of our full painting tray is 150. Uh, we want a 5 mil border on either side. So 140 is our width. Now I could set the depth of this object, but I don't really need to, because I am actually removing this from that. I'll show you in a sec here. So now we have our two squares. Um, the first thing you do is position it on your object where you actually want to remove it from. So the best way I found to do that is you just snap it, select the one face, select the face of your um, main object, and it'll snap right to the center of that object. Um, now normally it would group these two together, but if you have group while snapping on off, you just select that, it won't group the two. Um, if you didn't do that, you'll have to go up in here and ungroup Go to group and ungroup and it'll take the two apart but because I didn't group them while snapping they are not apart I can select each one individually so we've got it um, centered on our other square we don't want the pinning tray in the center though we want it up at the top here or the uh, parts tray sorry so you can zoom right in and you can see that we got a nice we are 0.5 mil away. Uh, linear snap. 0.5. Let's try that. There we go. So it's touching there, um, but we do want a 5 mil border like we did for the rest of this object. And zoom out. So we'll select our object, and I'm just using the arrow keys. You can actually click move and use this arrow, drag it down. You can see at the side there, five millimeter. Or you can do what I usually like doing, is using the arrow keys on the keyboard. Um, so if I was to select this object, I could arrow keys on the keyboard. All right? So if I had it, Right on the edge, and I want to go five in. I can change my linear snap to one millimeter, and then I can just click it five times. One, two, oops. One, two, three, four, five. So that's how I normally do it. Or you can just click on it and move it down yourself. Uh, so we can see we've got five millimeter border around everything. 
To control the view on this program, um, your mouse wheel, if you wheel in and out, that's zoom in and out. If you hold down on your mouse wheel, that gives you an XY kind of movement. And if you hold down right on your mouse button, that gives you your panning. So basically that's how you control everything here. It's not, not that hard. Anyway, so now we have it the right position. Uh, still not a parts tray. Um, it is touching the face of this, like these faces are touching because we uh, snap them together. So basically all I have to do is move this square down into that square. So we go move. And again, you can use your cursor keys. I like to use the arrow keys, or you can just use the arrow here. We'll move it down three millimeters, which means um, it's a five millimeter thick pinning tray. We have a three millimeter trough there. It's going to be. So you see we have one shape inside of another shape. Now if I was to take this away right now, I'll do it quickly just to show you what it looks like. because It's easy to uh, reverse. Oops. That. If I took it away right now, we would have a nice square parts tray, which uh, we don't want. We want nice rounded edges. So there's a tool in here called uh, Filet and Chamfer. So if you go up at the top here, and you can find, where are we? Under Modify, there is uh, Filet, which is round edges, and Chamfer, which is straight edges, like beveled edges. We want a Filet, nice round edge. I like to use the hotkeys, which uh, for Filet is E. So you can either click on this, or you can click E on the keyboard, which I normally do, which I'll be doing for the rest. And then you just click on the part that you want to round. See this, uh, this edge right here is the edge I want to round. And we're going to round it by five, five millimeter. So we got a nice five millimeter round edge there. That's the one we just did. So we will hit E again or go through the menu and find your fillet again. Click the next edge. Fillet it by five mil. And we'll go over to the other side. Do the same thing. E again. Select that edge. 5 mil. E again. Select that edge. 5 mil. You can actually drag this in and out with the arrow too if you want. But uh, I find it's easier to just work with, uh, with the keyboard. So 5 mil. Now we have nice round edges on our parts tray. Uh, now we can safely remove one from the other. To do that, you can uh, you go to Combine. Up in the menu here is Combine. And you go Subtract under the Combine menu. And you can see it's Close Bracket. Um, so I'm just going to use Close Bracket. You can actually click on that, on that uh, Subtract. You click on that icon. Or what I like to do is just Close Bracket. It's a lot quicker. Uh, you select your main object. You select the object you're taking away. Hit enter. And there we go. We have our little parts tray. Um, basically, that's what you do for, for all of the objects on the pinning tray. So, like, we want pinning grooves. To create one of those, we need uh, they're basically cylinders on their side. So, we're going to create a cylinder. Uh, the radius is actually double. So, if you want 6 mil, we have to tell it 3 mil because it's from the center out. So, this will give us a 6 mil cylinder, even though the radius is only 3 mil. You know how radius works. And our height is going to be the actual height of the pinning tray uh, or the um, pinning trough itself. So, we have a 100 millimeter high board. That is the height of our pinning tray. Um, 25 millimeters is taken up from the parts tray at the top. We have a 5 mil on the top and the bottom. That's 35 mil. Uh, we want another 5 mil in between the pinning troughs and the parts tray, uh, which is uh, 15 mil plus the 25 is 40 mil, which means our pinning trays are going to be 60 mil, so height of 60. Now we have a cylinder here, um, but it's not the right orientation. We would click on this cylinder. In the bottom here you can see Move, or Control T for short, and you can choose this little angle adapt angle uh, manipulator here or you can actually just click on it and type in 90 for your degrees to make sure it's a perfect 90 degrees 
Uh, click the mouse button or enter, one of the two. And now you have this cylinder just sitting here. You can move it over to your pinning tray. Uh, I like to hit the D button, or you can move this down or just do, uh, I just hit D, which brings it right down to the bottom. And um, now it's touching the bottom just like the pin tray is. Um, we want this to be two millimeters deep. It's a five millimeter board, so we'll bring it back up three mil. So that's the height we want. That's where we want it in the board. And now we just got to work on actually placing it in the right position. So um, what I like to do is line it up to one edge. And from there, we'll, uh, go. We look down from the top, we are touching both edges, everything's good. We want to move it 5 mil in and 5 mil up. So you can either use the arrow keys like I'm going to use, or you can use the move key. Um, and uh, arrow keys end up being easier for me. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 mil in, 5 mil up. We have our first representation of a pinning groove. Now we can go ahead and remove that right now and it will give us our, our pin groove, but instead of having to make these all over again, uh, the best thing to do is just copy and paste it. So, you know, uh, click on it, highlight it, go Control C, Control V, uh, V as in Victor, and it'll put a copy down. That's uh, copy and paste. And then you can just move the copy over. Uh, we'll move it over 9 mil, 8 mil, uh, yeah, we'll move it over. Oh, it looks better. Eight mil's good. So, uh, we have uh, number two. Let's go for number three. Control C, Control V. Move it over eight mil again. Control C, Control V. Move it over eight mil again. Basically, you're just copy and pasting as many as you need. And we're going to put another part straight at the other side here. But first, we're going to get these pinning grooves in here. I'm just moving it over eight every time. Ah, you can type it in too. So whatever is easier for you. And we'll do maybe one more. And the rest will be for parts tray. How many does that give us? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that should be good. Ten pinning grooves is more than enough, I think. And, um... You could chaffer these edges as well, but um, when you tilt the pinning tray, if these edges were chamfered, uh, the pin might just slip right out of the trough, and you don't want that. So I leave those edges flat, but you can uh, fillet those as well if you, if you wanted. So anyway, now all you have to do is, uh, like you did before, use your subtract. So you go up to your combined menu and hit subtract or use the close bracket like I used to do. Like I like to do. Hit your original, hit what you want to delete, hit enter, and you just keep doing that. Close bracket, board, pinning tray, enter, close bracket, click the board, click the trough, enter, close bracket, click the board, click the trough, enter. And as you can see, you just keep keep doing this. I think you might actually even be able to Hold down shift and select all of these and then hit enter and you can. Yep. Yeah. So there's our uh, pinning tray. So there's our troughs.
for our pins. And uh, as you can see, it's coming along nicely. All we need is our one more uh, part straight side here. Uh, we need to fillet the edges of the board itself, uh, maybe add a name or something like that, and we're done. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is another parts tray. So we go box again. Our length is going to be same as the pinning trays, which is 60 millimeters. And our width is going to be probably like 50. No, more than 50. 55. More than 55. 60 by 60. I don't know, maybe. I think it is actually. Yeah, looks like it. So we have a 60 by 60 square. And again, we're going to do what we can to get it right on the edge here. There we go. It's right on the edge. And I just got to move it in and up five. So select it. Up one, two, three, four, five, and over one, two, three, four, five. And we have it in place. Looks good. Again, we want to uh, chamfer or fillet our edges. So either up in the menu and go to modify and fillet, or use the E key, which is what I do. E, and you select the corner that you want to fillet and move it in five. Next corner, move it in five. Our next corner, move it in five. And our last corner, uh, move it in five. All right. And now um, we want this to be three deep like the last one. So I'm just going to hit D, which moves this all the way down to the bottom again, touching the bottom. And we'll move it up two millimeters because that will make a three millimeter deep tray. There we go. Two millimeters up, which means it's three millimeters deep. Everything's good. All we need to do is subtract it. Uh, you can go up to the top here again by combine and subtract. But I like to use the close bracket. Close bracket. Select our pin tray. Select the object we want to delete. Hit enter. There we go. We have a pinning tray. This is uh, pretty much ready to go. We clean up the edges here. We're going to chat for the edges again using E, uh, or you can go through the menu. And we'll give them all five mil uh, fillet radius. And don't be afraid to, uh, you know, screw up. If you if you screw something up, say I want to fillet this corner here, and oh, I accidentally selected that, uh, and you know, I accidentally rounded it some somehow. Don't know how weird. Selected the wrong edge, I think. And so say I did that by accident, and I uh, accidentally rounded the edge of this tray instead of the rounding the edge of the um, corner. I can just hit this undo button or control Z and it'll bring me one step back, which is cool. And then I can go, that's what I meant to pick. And then five, we're done. We have our radius set. And um, see if you did like the look of that, if you wanted to actually fillet this edge, uh, I wouldn't go by five, maybe like two, um, which would give us a round edge on our board, if that's kind of what you like. Um, I like a more flat edge on my board. They stack, they stack better that way, uh, looks better that way. So I won't be doing that, but you can if you want. That is basically uh, my basic pin tray that I make and send out to people. That is it right there. You design it once, you save the file, you put it on the printer, print it out as many times as you want. All right, battery ran out. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> anyway, um, as I was saying, that's pretty much it. Uh, you can add text to this with the uh, text tool here. You just click on text, and then you can put text wherever you want. I like to move it around, so uh, you just put it here, and say it's going to say, uh, I don't know, what? Well, 
West Coast picks. And we'll choose our font. You can play with these. I know Comic Sans works pretty good because I've used it many times. I'll give it bold. It's going to fit in this uh, part straight here, which is 25 millimeters. So we're going to make this like 16, maybe 18. That's 15. 18 might be a bit too big. We'll stick with, uh, well, this is 18. Yeah, it's probably too big. So you can always click on it again and edit. Fifteen. All right. And uh, once you have your text there, you can uh, click on it and um, <clears throat> go to extrude text. It'll ask you how much you want to extrude it. And this is going to be um, how much uh, lettering, like how, how far your lettering is raised. So um, we're going to give it 0.6 mil. Not quite a full mil. We'll give it 0 0.6. Should be good. And now we have an object, because we extruded it, that is uh, 0.6 mil of whatever we made it. So in this case, it's West Coast Picks. And as you can see, it's independent of our original text. So it's original text, you can actually just delete it now. Uh, now you have your object, which is our text here. And we want it in this pinning tray here, uh, up in this parts area. Again, we just use our snap tool, um, and because the snap tool works actually face to face, you can't uh, just click on the face here and then click on the board. Um, that would actually flip this upside down. You have to click on the back face because that's the face that we want to attach to the face of our pinning tray. As you can see, we can select areas here. So we actually want to select the top tool area. And it automatically centers it as best as it can in that area. As you can see, um, up and down is pretty good, but side to side is not. So we'll uh, move that over manually, get it to look good. Go there. Maybe a bit more. We'll use the arrow keys. That's probably good. All right, yeah, and just go in there and make sure that it's actually in there good. We did the uh, magnet, so it should be actually touching face to face, which is what we want. See our object there. All right. Now, if you want to uh, take a look at this without the grid in the background, give it a good look here. That's what our pinning tray is going to look like. Um, no, it didn't take too long, only to have to design it once, and then you can print that out as many times as you want. There are ways you can uh, rasterize images, like logos and stuff like that. You've probably seen me give pinning trays out like that, uh, where you can get people's logos on here and stuff like that. It is uh, a bit more intricate, and there's more software involved, and I can maybe do another video on that at a later date. But uh, for now, this is a nice pinning tray. So from here, we would go... Uh, uh, First, we'd want to save it, and you can either save it to my projects or my computers. My projects, you have to make an account and stuff like that, but you can access it anywhere on the cloud. So, uh, But to my computer, it's probably a better way to do it. And as you can see, I've got a ton of 3D printer stuff in here. Just a ton of stuff that I've already saved. This one, we'll call it uh, WCPYT for YouTube, PT for Pintray. All right. And you can see it says it as uh, .123DX. And um, it's important, you have to save this two different ways. So you have to save this as the 123DX, uh, which is an editable file where I can come in here, I can open this up again and change stuff around and it won't be a problem. 
And then the next thing we have to do is export this. Uh, export as 3D and STL. STL is kind of the universal language that all, um, all uh, slicing programs will use, like Cura and stuff like that will use STL. So STL is the format you always want to convert it to. No matter what editor you're using, you will convert it to STL. So STL and you want uh, fine because that's the best settings and combine objects. I could have combined the objects before I uh, saved the, the program because right now the pinning tray and the lettering are two different objects. And I could have combined the two, but you don't have to because this program will ask you when you export to STL if you want to combine objects. So I yes, always combine objects if it gives you the option. Uh, that just means that you haven't combined your objects. And if you wanted to, it's as simple as going combine, merge, this, with that, enter. Now we have one piece. Everything is selected. The letters are not separate. I click on the letters, the whole board gets selected. And now, if I export it STL, it won't even be an option. So export as 3D, STL, fine. Our combined objects isn't an option anymore because we just did it manually. And then, uh, okay. And we'll get an option to uh, save it as whatever you want. We'll do it the same thing. We'll go uh, WCPYTPT. Uh, save and that'll save it as an STL and now we have to go to our slicing program. What I use is Cura. Uh, Cura is uh, C-U-R-A. It's free. Just download it. All this stuff is free. Uh, you just download it and when you get your 3D printer it'll come with a CD with drivers and stuff like that. And on that will be a INI file which is the Cura settings. Alright so Cura is a slicing program. There are different ones, and it keeps all of the um, settings for your printer and all of your speed settings, temperature settings, and stuff like that. You have to set in your slicing program. As I said, this one's Cura, uh, C-U-R-A, and when you get your 3D printer, it'll come with a CD, and those CDs will have that CD will have drivers on it and stuff like that, and it should have Cura on it, and in there will be an INI file with all the Cura saved. Um, settings. But uh, an ANET A8 with the modifications I have on mine, these are the settings I run. Um, and <clears throat> I'll go through it a little bit here. Uh, my resolution's a little off because I was uh, playing a game that required a different resolution. But um, as you can see here, we have our um, layer height, which is uh, in millimeters, how, um, how high each layer of plastic is going to be. And uh, 0.2 millimeter is the resolution of this machine, of most machines, the ANET A8, A6, they're all 0.2 mil. And uh, so your uh, machine will dictate this. And uh, most machines are 0.02 layer height. <clears throat> um, our shell thickness, and shell thickness is when you're printing an object, the shell, the actual outside, all outside parameters of that object is the shell. Uh, so the minimum thickness of the shell of the object is going to be one millimeter. So no matter what all your other settings are, your shell is going to be one millimeter. You can change this, um, you know, have a thinner shell, you know, prints less plastic and stuff like that, but play with your settings, you will practice on things, and you'll, you'll get your numbers down. Um, top and bottom thickness, you can set these independent of the shell thickness. Um, I set it all to one because it seems to be a good thickness. Fill density is actually uh, the percentage of the object that's going to be pure plastic. So if I set this to 100, that pinning tray is going to be solid plastic through and through, and it's going to take up a massive amount of filament, and it's going to take a long time to print. Uh, fill the density at 20%. On those areas that are hollow, so we have a shell, shell thickness of one, those are definitely going to be one millimeter thick, uh, top, bottom, and the sides. So that means we have three millimeters on the inside of the pin tray that um, we can have a fill density of 20%, which means only 20% of that space on the inside of the object is plastic. The other 80% is air. So it'll print like honeycomb patterns and crisscross patterns uh, of air space in the object to save, you, um, to save you filament and save you time. 
and it's just as strong because the lattice work that it builds inside the, uh, the structure is good. So the fill density of 20% is a good standard, uh, depending on the object. It doesn't have to be robust. You can go down to like 10%. Uh, 20% is good. It'll hold screws and stuff like that. So 20% is a good standard. Um, your print speed is going to be the speed at which you actually lay down plastic uh, when you're printing an object. Uh, and this is in millimeters a second. Um, mine is 55. I can go up higher than that, but the quality starts to suffer a little bit. So uh, when I first got this stock, I couldn't break 40. So with my um, mods and stuff like that, I, I got it up to 55 comfortably. Uh, some things I could even speed it up a little bit and it wouldn't matter much. Uh, your printing temperature, this is going to be the temperature at which you're extruding your plastic. Uh, depending on what you're using, it says right here uh, for PLA, uh, is two, 210 Celsius and ABS is 230 Celsius. So um, I actually print it like uh, 210, uh, sometimes 215. And, uh, you know, it depends on, on your plastic and stuff like that. Different manufacturers have different recommendations. But for the most part, uh, the hotter you go, the better it's going to flow. Um, but you don't want to go too hot because you'll end up burning it. So those are the... Um, printing temperatures and then you have your bed temperature and um, this is the temperature of your heat bed on the printer um, normally it's supposed to you know like stock it was like 50 which was it did but 55 was better and uh, when I put the glass on because the glass uh, takes up a little bit of the thermal mass and everything I actually jacked it up another five so uh, 60 with the glass on the uh, on the heat bed works really nice for me uh, it's uh, in Celsius so it's the uh, print print bed temperature um, and then support is actually if you're building an object that has overhangs and stuff like that you can have a support that will actually uh, you know from the building plate up to your overhanging object or just everywhere so it could be from the build plate or the actual object itself it'll build like little raft structures little pillars um, that will uh, support the overhanging object, allowing you to print over negative areas, like over overhanging areas. Um, then you have platform adhesion type, which if you um, if you don't have a heated bed, you have to use a raft or a brim, which is where it will make a, uh, around your object, it'll make like a puddle. It'll print like a puddle around your object just to get the, uh, the plastic to stick to your, uh, to your print bed. And, uh, and then you have to cut it off after. So it's just a pain in the ass. Uh, with a good printer, decent printer, you don't have to use any kind of support type. Um, and filament. So our filament, the standard filament is 1.75 millimeter. That is standard for most printers and for my printer. And then we have a flow percentage. And that is, um, say if you're printing an object and you notice that you, uh, your printer is putting out too much plastic or not enough plastic, seems to be thin or, um, you know, it seems too much plastic or not enough plastic or whatever, you can actually change the flow percentage, fine tune here. Uh, say if it, if it looks a little thin and your lines are a little thin and they don't quite connect, you know, try bumping it up to 101%, 102% to see if it fills that gap there. Um, it's just to fine tune your flow uh, capability. And those are the basic settings for, uh, for whatever 3D printer you're using. And then um, advanced, um, these are settings you also have to set. So this is a nozzle size, stock nozzle on this machine and most machines is uh, 0.04. And uh, the retraction speed is the speed at which the, um, the extruder will actually pull the plastic back into the machine. It'll pull the plastic back as it makes a move over an area that's not supposed to be printed. And that stops you from trailing uh, plastic that's not supposed to be there out of the nozzle. Like when you use a hot glue gun and you pull the glue away um, and it leaves that string <laughs> behind. Uh, if you have a retraction, it's like actually pulling that glue stick back into the machine when you pull it away. So um, it's a really good feature. Some machines don't support it. Uh, this machine does. So, um, And then the distance, uh, the amount of retraction, the distance you want to pull back into uh, the machine when you're traveling. Uh, 4.5 mil is the standard amount of retraction. Um, and then your quality. So this is going to be the uh, each layer height that you uh, print. And the quality, you're going to be uh, restricted by your layer height, which is 2 mil. 
So that means that's the finest you can get, uh, and that's what we're doing. You can actually print 0.4, uh, but point 0.2 is going to give you the best actual quality. Um, and then uh, initial layer line with uh, 100%. So this is going to be the first layer that you lay down on the uh, bed. No matter what your basic settings are here for your shell thickness and your bottom top and stuff like that, no matter what those settings are, this is going to be the bare minimum amount that's going to be uh, printed down on the initial layer, which is just one layer, point, point 0.2 millimeter which is uh yeah not a lot but it doesn't matter because my shell thickness and your shell thickness should be more than that anyway um and then your cutoff object bottom um this is to it, yeah sinks, sinks the object into the platform so you'd actually uh have to use this this if you have um if you're printing onto something that doesn't have a flat bottom and you want to offset it by by a little bit you can but you don't need to. It's just an offset thing. Um, dual extrusion overlap. Well, I don't have a dual extruder, but if you had a dual extruder, this would be the amount that it overlaps the two colors of the filaments, just to uh, blend them in uh, a little bit better. And 0.15 is the, the standard there. And uh, this is where it comes right down to speed. So travel speed. This is when it's not printing and it's moving from place to place. Um, not printing the head speed will move uh, I got mine up to 100, 100 millimeter um, average is like 60 but with uh, the mods and stuff I have on mine 100 is good and if you have a really good machine uh, you can go up to 250 which is uh, a lot better than this <laughs> but still 100 millimeter seconds you know twice as fast as it prints kind of thing so that's that's pretty good um, the bottom layer speed so when you're printing the very first layer you want to make sure you got good adhesion, so we go slower, um, which gives the plastic more time to adhere to the uh, the, the heat plate. So um, the first layer, the first point uh, two initial layer thickness, is going to be at thirty five millimeters a second, just to make sure that we get a good stick down on the uh, build platform. Uh, infill speed. If you leave this blank, it'll just use uh, the normal print speed, which is what I do. Um, the outer shell speed, you can dictate the infill and the outer and inner shell speeds independently. If you leave them blank like I do, it just uses your default print speed, which works good for me. Um, if you have you know, special um, plastics or printing objects and stuff like that, you might want to fill, um, fiddle with these settings, but you don't really need to. And then um, your minimal layer time in seconds. If you're printing a really small object to uh, to do one layer right after another before it's had time to cool, like lay plastic right down on top of another uh, plastic you just laid. Uh, you want at least five seconds for the first layer to cool down before you put the next one on. It only counts for really, really, really small objects because like the pinning tray, it's going to take like a couple minutes or like at least a minute to do the first layer anyway, so it's not going to matter. Uh, that almost never comes into effect unless you're printing something very, very, very small. And that's about it. Um, there's plugins, and uh, here's here's the G code itself that you can look at after you've loaded something. Um, I have the Prusium Mendel i3, which is what my printer is a clone of. Um, that's the printer I have selected. You can actually go in here and install custom firmware. You can uh, select the machine that you're using and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so Kira, and then we will go file, and we will load model file. And we're going to load the um, file that we just saved, which was, um, what was it? WCP, uh, right there, YouTube bin tray. Open, .stl. So it only opens STLs. All these slicer programs will open STLs. And now you can see we have a nice visual representation of the pinning tray on the print bed. This this uh, bounding box here is actually the size of the printable area of my printer. Um, it knows because my machine settings, if you go there, my maximum uh, print width, height, and depth is all set there. It's actually higher than this, but I set it down because I don't want to print right to the edge. Um, and, you know, all your other uh, setting machine settings are in here, so... Anyway, um, you can see once we've loaded up the model, it's going to give you an estimate of uh, how long it's going to take and how much material it's going to take to print this uh, to print.
print the spinning tray. So as we see, we have our West Coast Pick spinning tray. It's at these current settings, it's going to take two hours and 49 minutes. And it's going to take 17.21 uh, meters or 51 grams of plastic. Um, and that is actually a good time. Before I did all my upgrades and uh, tweaked the settings and stuff like that, one of these would take me seven hours to print. So, you know, almost three hours is a lot better. You can play with your settings here if you want to drop your shell thickness down a little bit, say 0 0.8. It'll, um, it's not going to change much. It actually might, uh, might take longer, depending on, you know, the object that you're making. But you can play with your settings here, and you can try to drop your time down a little bit. I think I can get it to like 2.39 uh, and still get good prints. So 2 hours and 39 minutes, which, you know, it's not bad. You just hit a button on the printer and walk away, and it's done. So, See, it's actually more if I drop the shell thickness down, which is weird, but um, it takes a little bit uh, to get the infill in there. So if I change that back to 1 mil, change you back to 1 mil. And see if we upped our infill to 50%. Let's see what that does for our time. It's going to increase the amount of material it takes. Um, and it's going to increase how much the object weighs after. But it's not going to uh, increase the, or take anything or add anything to the look at all. It's going to look the exact same no matter what our infill is. So at 50%, it's 3 hours and 14 minutes, and we got 18.84 meters, or 56 grams. That is like almost double the weight. Uh, if we go back to 20, which is my standard. But you can see that uh, this object here that we're going to print, um, you really can't get it to go any faster. You can, you can up the speed and stuff like that, but the quality is going to suffer. These... Uh, these print speeds and settings are optimal for the machine that I have. So, 2 hours, 49 minutes, 17.21 uh, meters, and 51 grams of uh, plastic. And that's what we got for this pin tray. Now, um, this is a slicing program, so what it takes is our STL file, and it turns it into what's called G-code. And G-code is what... All of these uh, machines run off of my CNC router runs off a of G-code, the 3D printer runs off a of G-code, a regular CNC runs off a of G-code, that's what it is. So we will go um, save G-code. And it's already named WCP uh, YTPT uh, G-code. We'll save it. And I'm going to copy this onto an SD card and we're going to bring it over to the uh, 3D printer. And I'll see you there. All right, guys, this might be a little shaky. I apologize in advance, but, uh, you know, that's what it takes sometimes. Uh, tripod's not, not going to work here. Um, so I have it saved to a micro SD, and at the main board of at least the ANET A8, you might be able to see right there, there's a micro SD slot. And uh, because machine is relatively simple we have to actually if it, the machine's already on we have to unmount the SD card if if I plug it in while it's running um, we have to unmount the SD card remount the SD card <laughs> and then I can go to actually print file and select the file that we just made but uh, before I do that let me show you how to calibrate this thing um, we first want to Go to quick settings and home all. The menu and everything might be different for other printers, but the everything you do is basically the same. So you're going to home everything. And what that does is zeroes everything out. There's limit switches here. Limit switch there. There's a limit switch there. And there's a limit switch at the back of the uh, heat bed. And that just brings everything to zero for the machine. And then... Uh, you want to disable your stepper, which means uh, it turns the power off to the motors, which means you can actually uh, move these motors around now and not have to worry about uh, reverse powering anything or uh, anything like that. So um, Now to calibrate this thing, what you need is a sheet of printer paper. And you need to physically move this printer head to the corner of each uh, each corner of the glass so we'll bring the first 
corner here. And as you can see, it's almost touching the glass, just barely off the glass. Now what it has to be is the thickness, sorry, I'm trying to do this and hold everything steady at the same time, thickness of a sheet of paper. So this is actually a little too close. Uh, we're going to take a screwdriver and we're going to screw this in a little bit so that's down. And then it's going under, it's still a little tight. Uh, first I'm going to actually heat this up so we'll, uh, we'll preheat this. We'll go to quick settings. Uh, preheat PLA. So now, probably heard the fan bog down. That's because the power just kicked up. And we can watch all the temperatures increase. That is the temperature of the extruder. That is the temperature of the heat bed. So you can see, um, you can set these to whatever you want, but when you start printing, it defaults to whatever your printer settings were from Cura. Uh, so my preheat is 190 and 60. I print at 210 and 60, so yeah, that's pretty good. Anyway, um, this will heat up, and as it heats up, the uh, thermal masses being what they are, uh, the tolerances might actually change. So I might actually be able to fit this in here after it heats up. Another thing is this piece of paper is way too big, so let me... Um Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So, get in here. See if we can. So it's still a little too low. do like you know quarter or half turn at a time kind of thing uh, you don't have to go all out there we go that's that's actually perfect so the paper fits in there and you can feel it rubbing uh, you want to be able to feel it rubbing in between the nozzle you can actually probably hear the fan change if you listen So uh, it doesn't move around freely. It actually has a little bit of grab to the paper, and that's what you want. So you do that for all four corners, and you really only have to do this every, I don't know, a dozen prints or something like that. It depends on how good your machine is, but this one actually seems to hold its calibration pretty good. Yeah, that side's still good, as you can see. back corners do the same thing and as this is preheating I can actually smell the hairspray <laughs> before you couldn't smell it but as it preheats you can definitely smell it that one's good last corner and that one is good all right so I only had to adjust the one corner that's pretty good because I haven't uh, calibrated it quite a while so now we actually have it all calibrated uh, it's almost done preheating um, next thing we're going to do is uh, our quick settings and we'll home all again and now uh, basically I can uh, print file and we'll go to this is the SD card. I have a directory on here called Locksport. And then we'll go to the file. And they go in here in consecutive order. So the last file you put on your SD card is, card is going to be the last file on the list. And that's it. WCPYTPT. Dot G code. And hit send. And there you go. we got to wait for it to heat up fully. Which means... Um, glare on this thing. Um... The heat bed has to get up to 60, and the print nozzle has to get up to 210. Uh, the t print nozzle will probably get there first, but there you go. Um, 
if you didn't preheat, it would start from, from cold and we would have lost all that time that I set calibrating. I would have had to wait for the print to start. So as you can see, it's going to wait for it to uh, warm up. It gets close enough, starts printing. And it always lays down a little, um, I don't know what you'd call it, a uh, kind of like a, a lead outline, I guess. It's just one line around the circumference of the print just to make sure everything's flowing out of the nozzle properly before it starts on the, the real print. So. As you can see, it's uh, printing away. And this is going to take uh, pretty much the exact amount of time it said on the uh, program, so two hours and 49 minutes or whatever. And um, yeah, we'll come back when it's done and I'll show you what it looks like, but I'm pretty sure we all know what it's going to look like. <laughs> That's all there is to it, guys. Um, you know, main, maintain your machine, make sure uh, you, you calibrate it regularly. Um, another good thing to do for calibration, if you find that you can't quite uh, get your levels right, I have this stick here underneath. The, keep all my tools underneath the uh, heat bed. <laughs> uh, I have this popsicle stick here that I cut down. And what I do is I put this popsicle stick in between this base here and the very bottom of this piece because it's this equal on both sides. So um, when I'm calibrating I always check to make sure I bring these bring these white pieces both up to the same level and I make sure that with this stick that they're at the exact same height on both sides because if this thing is on an angle you'll you'll never fully calibrate so you got to make sure that that's level as well um, other than that we're good to go she's printing her first layer remember this is half speed uh, for the first layer and then uh, all the other layers after that will be almost twice the speed so We'll be back in a little bit, and uh, we'll see what it looks like. All right, here we are, uh, just over halfway done. And uh, you can see, it looks like I accidentally left uh, the raft option on. Looks like a little brim. Uh, that does come off easy, though, so we'll, I'll show you that. But normally, I don't print it with that brim on there. Um, yeah, as you can see, there's our infill. Uh, the holes, that's the 20% infill. And, um, yeah, you can pretty much see the speed that it's going. And... All that good stuff. Anyway, we'll see it again when it's done. Alright, guys, uh, it's next morning, <laughs> which to me is uh, like 9 30 at night. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's done printing. It's cooled down now, and as you can see, it just pretty much falls off. And um, we have that brim that I accidentally left checked. And that's going to be a little bit to clean up, which is why I never use them. Um, you don't really need them anyway, but as you can see, it does just come off, but it's a little bit of a little bit of messing with to get it to come off. It's just a single layer of uh, plastic. There you go. And basically, you just do that all the way around. But we have. One designed pinning tray, fully printed out, works good. Uh, if I didn't do that raft feature, I wouldn't have to sit here and pick it off. But uh, now I gotta sit here and pick it off. Anyway, all right, guys, I just uh, stripped all the uh, raft or brim off of the print, and there we go. We have one printed out, 3D printed pinning tray. Now just uh, uh, spray adhesive the, the back, put some felt on, trim it, 
and uh, you would have a nice working pin tray with your name on it. And you can work out your own designs and all that crazy stuff. Um, 3D printers are, are really handy. <laughs> uh, if you're a do-it-yourself kind of person or you like to tinker with stuff, uh, 3D printer is just awesome. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, and also the CNC router. <laughs> and laser engraver and all that. Anyway, guys, um, again, if I left anything out, if you have any more specific questions, just uh, let me know, and I'll do my best to answer. Later.